Hello, everyone. Welcome tonight. It is Sunday night, June 2nd, and my name is Glenn Rawson. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for joining me at, for this devotional tonight. And as always, I would ask that you would have a prayer in your heart. The purpose of this devotional is to talk about the Savior, is to talk about stories of faith, and the purpose is to inspire. Therefore, I really hope that tonight something will be said that will be edifying, cheering, and give you the strength and power that you need. So to begin with tonight, I'm going to do something a little bit unusual in that um, I would like to begin by telling you a story that, uh, well, I guess I haven't told it before. Many people have wondered where and how I learned to tell a story. Well, honestly, I learned how to tell stories by listening to Paul Harvey when I was a kid. I used to love listening to his news and comment and his rest of the story. But then uh, my life took an interesting turn of events. I started teaching seminary. And of course, one of the ways to really engage with my students was the sharing of stories. And I developed a philosophy early on. If you're going to teach the scriptures, then you have to know the scriptures, every detail, every, every comma, every sentence, the inflection, the emotion behind it. And so that's how I, that's how I taught the scriptures was from the vantage point of these are the Lord's edited stories. And so therefore, um, I worked hard to know those stories. It came to a head 1995, 97, something like that, when a friend of mine, Carl Watkins, there in Idaho, was working for KLCE Radio, and uh, he asked me one day if I would be willing to share some stories on the air, ins inspirational stories, as part of their Sounds of Sunday program. Well, I listened to the Sounds of Sunday program there in Idaho, and, you know, it, it, it was it was. It was inspiring religious devotional music all day Sunday. That's what it was. Well, I said, sure, but nothing really came of it. And then, you know, some months later, Carl approached me again. Was I really serious about doing this? Yeah, let's do it. So we went down to KLCE into this little broom closet studio. And we sat down in that studio. It was so small. And I recorded three stories, three inspirational stories. Um, I think out of the New Testament, as I recall. And uh, Carl produced them, and he was a, he's a master at that. He produced them, set them to music, and took them to the management. And the management loved it and said, would you do three stories a week for the next year? Now, three brand new stories, writing, researching, recording, and producing, that's a lot of work. And it took Carl and I a prodigious amount of work to get that done. But we agreed to do it. And I remember the struggle that I had right off the bat was, do I really want my name being put out there as a teacher of righteousness? Somebody's going to look at me and say, this guy's nothing more than a modern Pharisee. So I was really reluctant. In fact, at one point, I didn't even want to give my name. I would just be this anonymous storyteller. But I was prevailed upon, as it were, by a local stake president that I should do it and use my name and be prayerful in going forward. So we did. And uh, the management of KLCE, uh, Jim Burgoyne and others were so kind. They offered to pay me actually when I started doing that and I said, no, it would be a public service. And from that day to this, 1997, 95, whatever it was, to this, I've still never received anything for those stories written uh, for the radio. Well, from there, it took off. It's still going. Those stories are still on radio stations all over the country. Carl still produces those stories, still produces a syndicated Sounds of Sunday program, and it's run all over the United States, mostly the Western United States, and now, Carl has it running on Sounds of Sunday 24-7. He does a masterful job with the music, the narrations, and my stories, and has continued through all of that time to send it out 
as a public service to the to the to the world. Um, again, that sounds a Sunday twenty four seven. If you wanted to uh, to tune in and give a listen to Carl's program, well, that went on from there. I did the sounds of Sunday for years. I don't even know how many years, many years. And uh, and then eventually I moved to Utah and we kind of slowed down on that. But altogether, those few stories that we first did have now become close to 1,300 produced stories. And now there's Sounds of Sunday and 24-7, which Carl still does a wonderful job with. And then there's Glenn Ross and Stories on the other side where we've archived all of the stories I've ever done. I've learned over the years, and again, it's a public service. It still is a public service. I've, I've mentioned this before that we send out a produced copy of those stories every Sunday for anyone who wants it, and that is free of charge. It still is, and it will remain such as long as I have anything to say about it. My friends, um, I engage with the gospel through the doctrine and through the stories in the scriptures. I was just reading the scriptures this morning about Nephi. I started over in the Book of Mormon about Nephi and Lehi's vision of the tree of life and the story of Lehi wandering in a darkened wilderness engaged me and suddenly for the first time I saw something in that story that was meaningful to me in that Lehi, a good man, found himself in a darkened wilderness and he was afraid and he called upon the Lord and what happened next changed everything. And for the moment this morning while I was reading my scriptures, I found myself in that story. I found myself identifying with Lehi walking in a darkened wilderness of difficulty and not knowing why this is happening and trying to understand what to do about it. And out of the story came my answers. That's happened to me so many hundreds, and perhaps even thousands of times. So I continue now from the help that Carl and Jim gave me to share those stories around the world in an effort to teach true principles first and foremost and inspire and lift and encourage people to come to Christ and find their happiness in him. From that day to this, we continue. And as long as the Lord allows me strength, I will continue. Second story for tonight. What I'd like to do now was going to seem a little unusual, but I would like to describe in detail from a scientific and medical point of view, what happened to the Lord Jesus on the last 24 hours of his life. You'll recall that while he was in the upper room, that he began to feel very sorrowful and there was a heavy feeling over that room and the disciples were oppressed by it as well. And then you'll recall that he left that upper room and went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the scripture records that he said to them, my, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Have you and I ever known that kind of sorrow? The emotional pain that weighs upon the physical body and brings it down unto death. That's not hyperbole. And then you'll recall that during the events of Gethsemane, Jesus sweat great drops of blood. Most of the Christian world thinks that that is some form of anxiety because of the cross that awaits him. But no, it's not. It's the atoning sacrifice, the beginnings of the atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somehow, and in a way incomprehensible, a great burden of agony, payment, atoning redemption, I don't know all the words to describe it, came upon him and came through him. I have always believed that the atonement was not an infinite burden on him so much as it was 
an infinite stream of individuals through him. He became the sacrificial lamb for all of us. All of our sins were placed upon him. Every last one, not just our sins, our weaknesses, our transgressions, all mistakes, every pain and distress, all of the human suffering came upon the master that night in the garden. He was the only one that could bear it, but even then it caused him to sweat great drops of blood. Now, medically, that is called hematohydrosis. It means that literally what was happening is the capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands break down. They rupture under the strain and the blood released from those vessels mixes into the sweat glands and therefore the body sweats great drops of blood. Now this condition is medically known and proven, but for an individual to suffer just enough anguish to sweat from even one or two pores is almost, as it were, life-threatening. And Jesus's anguish was so deep that he sweat from every pore. Suffering from the blood loss, his skin now made exceedingly tender because of all that he's endured, the three hours that he has endured there, he is then arrested and taken before the Sanhedrin. He walks maybe a mile, mile and a half, up to the, the place where the Sanhedrin has met. He has not slept. He's been up all night. <clears throat> he has suffered un unspeakable anguish. And then as the night continues, he is taken before the Sanhedrin where he is humiliated, embarrassed, mocked, and beaten. And they spit in his face, his skin tender. The loss of blood is worsened. Then he is taken before Pilate, will you, where you will recall, as I told you last week, eight times Pilate the pagan tried to release the Son of God and the Jews would not hear of it. And finally, Pilate says, I will flog him. That's not the words he uses. I will flog him, which means he would have Jesus beaten. Now, that was part of Roman law. It weakened the body in preparation for crucifixion. Usually when someone was flogged like that, the accuser stood naked, strapped to a pole. And when they flogged him, they took a whip, which consisted of several long strands of leather. Woven into the middle of the strips of leather were metal balls and bits of bone, sheep bone. And every time that whip was, was striped across his back, anywhere from the back of the head to the back of the thighs, it would shred the skin, tear out large chunks of flesh, dig deep into the muscles, the balls bruising, the bone shredding. And after 40 stripes, save one, 39 stripes, the skin on Jesus's back would have been shredded into long ribbons. By this time, he has lost a huge volume of blood which will then cause the blood pressure to fall, put the body into shock. And that creates all kinds of conditions that go with him. But then the Roman soldiers plait a crown of thorns. I've seen this plant, those ugly, nasty thorns. They plait a crown of thorns, place it on his head, and then drive the thorns into the flesh of the scalp. You know how much a wound like that would bleed. Then they place the robe, 
the purple robe that Herod had given him. They placed the robe against his shredded skin, which would act as it were, as a tissue against a wound. It would cause the blood to coagulate, to clot, and it would momentarily stop the bleeding. Then they, then they take the cross piece, not the whole cross, but the cross piece. It's called the patibulum. The patibulum was the bar that formed the T in the cross. They placed that upon his shoulders and as part of the traditional punishment, he is required to carry it through the streets, outside the city of Jerusalem to the road entering into Jerusalem. And he carries it only a short distance. And because of his exceedingly weakened condition, he shouldn't even be alive. He can't carry it. So they press upon Simon, a Cyrenian, and he carries the cross. When they reach Golgotha, which translates as place of burial, they rip the robe off of Jesus's back and the bleeding would start again. They throw him down to the ground in those wounds, mingling blood and dirt into his flesh. And they nail him to the cross. Now it describes that they drove the spikes into his hands and feet. But research has demonstrated that this ancient form of punishment begotten or dreamed up by the Persians about 300 BC, the Romans didn't invent it, involved driving a nail through the hands and or the wrist. It was both. They could do and often did do both because the nail through the hand wouldn't hold the weight of the body but the nail driven through the bones of the wrist would. So they drive those spikes into Jesus's hands and wrists, and then they pick up this cross piece, the patibulum, and with him suspended by just those nails, now in, then they would lift it into the post, which was already set in the ground and they would affix the cross piece onto the bar. And right above it was the titleist, or the place where the title was placed, pronouncing this individual's crime. In other words, crucifixion was meant to be a punishment, the most excruciating that we know. Our word excruciating comes from the word crucifixion meaning it's an agonized death, a public form of punishment meant to set an example. So Jesus is, is crucified on the road coming into Jerusalem, made a public spectacle and an example of the, of the forsaken of God to all men. They place him upon the cross. Then, more than likely, they put one foot over the other and drove a spike through the feet. Imagine for a moment, if you can, the pain. Just this pain alone of the nail through the hands and through the wrists, it severs a major nerve that runs into the hand causing spasms of pain to run up the arm and into the shoulders. Same thing into the feet. Severing the nerves in the feet would cause shock and unspeakable pain through the legs. Now that's just the beginning of it. Jesus is already weakened from a loss of blood, from the shock of what his body has already endured. But then, as you'll recall, they come and they offer the Savior vinegar mingled with gall. No one knows for exact what that gall translates was, but it probably was sour wine mingled with myrrh, 
which had the effect of being something of a drugging agent to deaden some of the pain. This form of punishment was usually reserved for slaves and the lowest of criminals, uh, for traitors and revolutionaries and the vilest of people received this punishment. When Jesus received the vinegar and perceived what it was, he wouldn't take it. Why? He made the full and complete choice to feel, feel everything that was about to happen. Why? For that matter, why is he even there? You'll recall that as the Savior hung there, he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is the part that the world does not understand. For that matter, neither do we. But all, all that the devil and his machinations and power could throw at the Son of God, all of Lucifer's vengeance was foisted upon Jesus while nailed to the cross. The atonement, the, 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 the burden and agony of the atonement was fulfilled. The suffering was fulfilled, not just on, in Gethsemane alone, but also on the cross. The anguish, the emotional anguish that he felt on the cross was indescribable, literally incomprehensible to mortal and finite beings. The physical suffering, we can get some idea because with the spikes driven through his hands and the body suspended in a position like that, he can't breathe because the body, the diaphragm, your muscles pull it down, the lungs fill with air, and then you, you exhale, you force the diaphragm up and the lungs exhale. But he can't. In that position, the lungs fill up with air, but you can't breathe out. The only way to respire or to breathe out is to stand up on the nails driven into the feet. It's the only way he can do that because he can't breathe, not to mention he's already suffering a, a, a horrible thirst from blood loss and the shock and the pain all of what he's dealing with, he can't breathe. He's suffocating. The nail driven through his hands, seven to nine inches long, severs the major nerves in the hands and in the feet, the median nerve, it's called. By standing up on the nails, he is allowed some measure of breathing. But oft times when they nailed wrists and then lifted them up like that, it dislocated the elbows and the shoulders. As he hangs upon the cross, unable to breathe, there is there begins to be a buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood. The heart starts beating faster to compensate for the lack of air. And because of the buildup of carbon dioxide, carbonic acid, the vessels, the capillaries begin to break down. There starts to be a buildup of fluid in the lungs and around the heart, pericardium, fluid builds up around that. And the longer he hangs there, the more difficult it becomes to breathe. 
the more the fluid builds up, the lungs would begin to collapse. Sometimes the stress of it was so bad that the individual at that point would just simply die of a heart attack, cardiac arrest. The heart would just stop. In other cases though, and this seems most likely, that the accelerated stress on the heart and the buildup of fluid around it would lead to what is called cardiac rupture. The left ventricle, the bottom part of the heart, simply that which expelled the blood throughout the body, burst. And there he hung from nine in the morning until three in the afternoon. Indescribable pain physically and emotionally, spiritually, so much worse. At the end, Jesus said, I thirst. Now we know why he thirsted. The loss of blood creates a raging thirst. They gave him something to drink, and when he had received it, he said, Father, it is finished. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then, voluntarily, he died. Now, later on, the Sabbath was coming on, and it was against Jewish law to have these crucified victims hanging on the cross. They didn't want them to violate their Sabbath, so they would appeal to the Romans, and Pilate dispatched soldiers who came, and as you'll recall, what did they do? They went to each of the thieves crucified with Jesus, one on each side, and with a big club and a mighty swing, they broke their legs, probably hit them right across the shins. That would cause, effectively, both of the thieves now, unable to stand up and breathe, they would suffocate quickly. When they came to Jesus, they discovered that he was already dead. And for whatever reason, John 19, 34, to assure that he was dead, one of the soldiers reared back and thrust a spear into his side. And John records that forthwith came there out blood and water. What was that? The blood could well have been the blood from the ruptured heart and the water or what appeared to be water, the edema, the filling of fluid around the heart. Again, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know all of the technical terms, but medically, it makes sense what they did to murder the Christ. Now, at least in part, why was the Savior there? He didn't have to be there. He had told Peter earlier, thinkest thou not that I can call upon my Father and he will presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? I think 72,000 angels sent from the courts of glory could have taken on the entire Roman Empire, let alone deal with a co or centurion and a few soldiers and some Jews. He didn't have to be there. He went voluntarily and he suffered every measure of pain in its fullness willingly. Why? You. Me. He died for us in the most painful way imaginable. He died for me. He died for you. Sacrificed his own life because of his love for you and the Father's love for us. 
I want you to understand. And I tell you this as I felt impressed to do, to emphasize to you that Jesus is, next time you're taking the sacrament, remember Jesus' suffering. He took our sins in us, in his body, on the tree, Peter said. I was, in effect, nailed up there with him. The next time you take the sacrament, remember what he did in his body on the tree and how much it hurt. What I just shared with you is not a written story. It comes from the research that I've done. I hope and pray that it will be received in the spirit that it's meant, and it will be, a, it will be something useful to you. Next story. You'll remember that Mary Magdalene had seen the resurrected Lord at the tomb. And why was it her? I don't know. You'll also remember that she ran to tell the disciples that they had seen her, seen him. And if you'll recall, between Mary and the other women, the disciples didn't believe them. They believed her not. Well, Later on that same day, probably somewhere really close to evening, two of those disciples, possibly Luke and Cleopas, walked a distance out to uh, uh, Emmaus, and they saw the Lord. And they came running back to tell the disciples who were that time behind locked doors and revealed that Jesus was a literal, corporeal, physical being with body, parts, and passions, and carrying those identifying wounds, and that he ate bread before them or broke bread with them. And then you'll recall that they came running back, told the disciples what they had seen, and then all of a sudden, Jesus appeared standing in their midst, and they were terrified. And he said, why are, you, why are you terrified and affrighted? It is I, be not afraid. And then, literally, the Savior had an intimate moment with his disciples, wherein he taught them, ministered to them, showed them his hands and his feet, and sat down and ate with them. But as you recall, of the 12, only 10 were there. Judas was gone because he had committed suicide. Who was the one missing? Thomas. Thomas was not there. Well, later on, as you can imagine, the disciples told Thomas that they had seen the Lord. And you'll recall, Thomas believed them not. He said, except I shall see the prints of the nails and put my finger into the prints of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, for that declaration right there, Thomas has been called Doubting Thomas ever since, a name that in my mind is undeserved and unfair. After all, Thomas only declared that which all the rest of the disciples had already said earlier. And he was only saying the same thing. And who can blame Thomas or the disciples for that matter anyway? They had watched Jesus tortured and murdered before their very eyes. His body completely mangled, mutilated, and destroyed. Of course, he can't be alive. Besides that, the story of the women, their tales were just too fantastic to believe. It can't be. And then the scripture records that eight days later, the disciples were gathered together again behind closed doors. And Jesus appeared once more in their midst and said unto them, peace be unto you. And then in that second meeting with Jesus and the 12, the Lord then turned to Thomas 
and singled him out and said, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing, end of quote. Now I'll come back to that in a moment. What happens next, I believe, requires certain experiences to be fully understood. Because Thomas answered at that moment and said unto him, with great joy and profound emotion, my Lord and my God. Something that likely in the days ahead you will say those very words with the same emotion that Thomas said them. And then Jesus taught a very critical truth, essential to all of our salvation, every single one of us, if we would be saved. He said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Think about that. We are saved first and foremost by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and by faith in the word of the Lord's authorized witnesses. Why did he upbraid Thomas? Be not faithless. How was Thomas faithless? He believed in the Lord. He had followed the Lord. He was faithless because he had not listened and believed his trusted brethren and other witnesses. What does that mean for me? If I'm going to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I must have faith in his authorized witnesses and his trusted authorized servants. And if I do, if I do, if I trust them, I trust him. And if I live my life in obedience to the Lord's prophets and come unto Christ as they lead me, then the day will come when, like Mary, we will see for ourselves, touch for ourselves, and know of a surety. But until then, faith, means we trust, we listen, and we obey. Let's take a break for a moment. I would like to thank all of those, all those of you now over 23,000 weekly free subscribers who have written to Glenn Ross and Stories and asked to receive the free weekly stories written and produced in video, I would like to thank you and invite you to spread those stories, give them to everyone. The stories are true insofar as we have the facts of history and the details, those stories are true and they have the power of truth with them. Send them out and if someone you know needs them or if you are one that would like to receive them, write to me at support at glenrossonstories.com and I will send you the link how you can receive those free stories. Next, some of you know that the new hymn book just came out. Well, let me rephrase that. 13 of the hymns that will be in the new book just came out. I haven't had an opportunity yet to go through and peruse those, but one of those, is one of my favorites. And so once again, I would like to share with you the story behind one of those brand new hymns that will be in the book. And it's also, the story is described in the hymns volume one book that Jason Tonioli and Gene Tonioli and I published a year or so ago. That book has this story along with many others. Horatio Spafford came to Chicago in 1856 to practice law. Horatio was a devoutly religious man, and not just one who taught Sunday school on Sunday, but one who practiced his, his religion every day of the week. He taught Sunday school classes, yes, 
But during the week, he visited the sick and the imprisoned and ministered as a ministering brother wherever he could. In 1857, he first met Anna Larson, a recent immigrant from Norway. He was taken by her beauty and her confidence. However, <laughs> Anna was only 15 years old. So Spafford sent her off to school to an elite women's school where Anna was educated. And after three years, she graduated and they were married. During the Civil War, Horatio and Anna volunteered and served where they could, aiding and abetting the Union cause. Horatio continued working as a lawyer and a senior partner in the firm and as a professor of law. Then in 1870, tragedy struck the family. Only the beginning. Their four-year-old son, Horatio Jr., died of scarlet fever. Then, tragedy again. In October 1871, the Great Chicago Fire reduced the wooden city of Chicago to ashes, taking with it most of Horatio's considerable real estate investments. Notwithstanding their loss in the fire, the Spaffords worked to assist others stricken similarly. In 1873, the family decided that they would go on holiday to England. However, at the last minute, Horatio was detained because of business in the city and sent his wife and four remaining children on up ahead. It was Anna, the mother, the 11-year-old daughter, also named Anna, nine-year-old Margaret, five-year-old Elizabeth, and two-year-old Tanetta. As they crossed the North Atlantic bound for the United Kingdom, November 22nd, 1873, their ship, the Via du Havre, was rammed midships by another vessel, the Lockhart, and it went down in 12 minutes. It would be one of the worst maritime disasters in the 19th century. 226 people lost their lives. Among them, the four daughters of Horatio and Anna Spafford. At the moment of collision, Anna gathered her children, looked for a way to escape, attempted to comfort and assist other passengers, but as the ship tipped onto its bow and started to go under, the babe Tanetta was torn from her arms by the waves and swept away, as were the other girls. When it was all over, the four daughters were either drowned or succumbed to the icy waters of the North Atlantic. Anna was found floating semi-conscious on a piece of planking. After her rescue, she was overheard to say, God gave me four daughters. Now they have been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. She would later testify that in anguish and grief, she had heard a still small voice speaking to her, you were saved for a purpose. When she arrived in Cardiff, South Wales, she sent a telegram to Horatio that read simply, saved alone, what shall I do? Horatio immediately boarded a ship and set out to join Anna. As they sailed, it is reported that on that voyage, one day, somewhere out over the Atlantic, the captain called Horatio to the bridge. As he entered, the captain pointed to his navigation charts and said, this is where she went down. Evidently, four miles under the keel was where the Via du Havre lay, the grave of his daughters. We can only imagine Horatio's emotions. It is recorded that he returned to his cabin and under the inspiration of the Almighty wrote these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It would become the beloved Christian hymn, It is well with my soul. <laughs> Do 
Well, Horatio and Anna returned to Chicago alone, where in the ensuing years, three more children were born. But like Job, was it the end of their suffering? No. Their little boy, only surviving son, died at the age of four. It is said that the people of their congregation there in Chicago began to talk. What in the world? What did the Spaffords do to so offend God that he would afflict them in such a manner? Horatio and Anna Spafford left Chicago, left their church, and went abroad where they could practice their Christianity in full. Where did they go? Jerusalem. And there they established the famous American colony where Horatio and Anna lived out the last full measure of their days, practicing Christianity as they understood it, which means all were loved and served. All were welcomed at their home and ministered to. They gave everything they had in a, and in a land still of enemies and allies, Jews, Arabs, Christians, Muslims, Anna and Horatio took no sides. Both, all were welcomed, all were loved, all were served, all were fed, and all were given a bed. Horatio and Anna Spafford went forward with faith, notwithstanding the severity of the trials that came upon them. This is what faith means. Keep going. Whatever my lot, happy or sad, it is well with my soul. Those two faithful souls are buried in Jerusalem, awaiting that day when the Lord will come to their city and call them up. Indeed, it is well with their souls. Next story. I was in Pocatello yesterday speaking to, the, to a stake there on Hawthorne Road to a group of youth. They were beginning a youth conference and I wanted to share this story but I just didn't have time. Most of you know the story of the Stripling Warriors. You know that about the 26th year of the reign of the judges, the Nephites were in a very dangerous situation because Lamanite forces had swept into the land and gone up the eastern seaboard and conquered city after city after city. Then Amalekiah had been killed by Teancum and Amaron, his brother, took over and split the forces and a group of men, army, went down the west, or went over to the West Sea in the southern extremity of the country and took city after city after city that belonged to the Nephites. And the intent was to come right up the east and the west and fall upon Zarahemla and conquer it. And Moroni, Teancum, and Lehi are on the east fighting the Lamanites and holding them from accomplishing their purposes. And Helaman and the 2,000 boys are sent to the West Sea South. And you know the famous story in the battle, in, 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 in the battle of Antipara and in the battle of Cumani, how that these stripling sons went to war and fought with the fierceness as if with the strength of God and so terrified the Lamanites that they defeated them and the Lamanites gave up in fear to a bunch of boys. It is one of the most remarkable stories in scripture and it gets so much press coverage and all the way through it, remember what the boys said, we do not doubt. They were boys, men of faith and they fought with faith the good fight against evil. And it just so happens that the evil in their day were Lamanite oppressors coming with swords 
to either take their lives or take their liberty. And they were not willing to surrender either. Everybody talks about the first two battles, the battle in the wilderness above Antipara and the battle for Cumani. But nobody talks about the third battle, which in my mind is probably the worst one. Because Helaman and the boys retreat back to their city. The forces of the Lamanites in the West Sea South are so numerous that they cannot come to battle against them. They do not have the power to do it, to sweep into a fortified city and take them, take them away. The Lamanites are holed up in the city of Manti, the last major city heavily fortified and the Lamanite force garrisoned there was so much stronger and so much better provisioned than were the Nephites. So they can't get in there to get them out. As they wondered and waited, it becomes a standoff and it stretches into months. The Nephites, Helaman and the boys start running out of food and the Lamanites with many men and food aplenty start launching guerrilla attacks against the beleaguered Nephites, starving as it were, weary and discouraged because they had written letters back to Zarahemla, send us men, send us food. And they got neither in substance enough to support them. These boys had fought with such faith and had saved their country so far. But now in my mind, they are faced with the greatest battle of them all not the battle without with the sword, but the battle within, the battle in the human heart against fear, discouragement, doubt, a lack of faith. Helaman, their captain, wrote these words. He said, we were grieved and filled with fear, lest by any means the judgments of God should come upon our land to our overthrow and destruction. And then I love what it says next. Therefore, we did pour out our souls in prayer to God that he would strengthen us and deliver us out of the hands of our enemies. Alma 58, 9 and 10. Please notice that the, at their greatest moment of the failure of faith called fear, they didn't give in to despair they turned and raised their voices up to God in prayer. Not in fear, in faith. And he heard them. Helaman continued, the Lord our God did visit us with assurances that he would deliver us, yea, insomuch that he did speak peace to our souls and did grant unto us great faith and did cause us that we should hope for our deliverance and we did take courage with our small force and were fixed with the determination to conquer, Alma 58, 11 and 12. And with no more men than they had before, no more food to feed them or arms or reinforcements than they had before, Helaman and the boys went forth and by stratagem and force of will and arms defeated the mightiest force of Lamanites gathered on the West Sea South and took back all the cities that the Lamanites had taken from them. It was a victory, a rout. Understandably, we laud Helaman and the 2000 teenage warriors for their faith and courage in battle. Yet, in my mind, it was that third battle at Manti that tested their mettle the most. The fight against the inner man, the natural man, the fight against discouragement. It's the same today for every one of us. It matters not what other wars we win out here. If Lucifer beats us in here, faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If nothing else, it means 
we just will not give up. We will raise our voice in prayer every time we take a hit. And we'll get up and in faith just keep going. Good night. God bless. I love the Lord and I love you.